curator of the Boca Raton Historical Society and Museum. Welcome to our virtual lecture series, Boca History 101. We have muted your microphones, please don't unmute and do not join with computer video because we are recording this session. Uh, and we're going to provide a link to the recording to everyone who signed up for our series. Today, we are talking about Boca Raton during World War II, part one. I can hear an echo. Okay. <laughs> But first, a word from our sponsor. The Boca Raton Historical Society and Museum was founded in 1972 to collect, preserve, and share artifacts relevant to the history of Greater Boca Raton and to act as an advocate for historic preservation in our community. Today, we're in the midst of our History Alive project to bring new professionally designed permanent exhibits in multiple installations to our headquarters at Town Hall. As a matter of fact, our designers are actually unloading and installing part of our new exhibits today. It's very, very exciting. So to find out more about this project and possibly donate, we ask that you visit our website, bocahistory.org. There you will find many resources on local history, including online history curricula for area school teachers, online exhibits, the Spanish River Papers publications, uh, a timeline, and of course, information on our, our lectures, tours, um, children's programming, and uh, special events. So to start off with, I wanna talk a little bit about the resources at our command in terms of the topic of World War II in Boca Raton, and particularly the Boca Raton Army Airfield because I get, over the years, uh, a lot of inquiries from the families of veterans who were stationed, however briefly, in Boca Raton during the war. In 1973, there was a terrible fire at the National Personnel Records Center, and many of the uh, Army Air Force records were actually destroyed at that time. So that's why it's really hard to research uh, Army Air Corpsmen from this era. The Maxwell Air Force Base is the home to the Air Force Historical Archives. They do have some material on the Boca Raton field. And it uh, consists of some documents, no lists of enlisted men or anything like that. Um, um, some of it is um, histories of the base uh, written in 1942 uh, and some really wonderful photographs. We have copies of that material, thankfully. But most of the objects, um, photographs, documents, and memories in our collection have come from veterans and the families of veterans, as well as our wonderful city of Boca Raton, um, partly because the engineering department left their old files in town hall, which is where we're located, but also the city clerk's office is always on the alert, alert and um, has found a few treasures for us uh, hidden in closets in various places. And of course, we have some FAU professors who have a natural interest in the history of the base who have shared things that they have collected with us. And we're very grateful to all of these donors. So first, let's set the scene. 1940, before the war begins, Boca, uh, a little town, 700, maybe 750 residents, Farming town with a big fancy hotel, the Boca Raton Club. And on your left, we see a view of Federal Highway looking north from about Southeast First Street. Uh, in the distance, in the center, you can see the cupola of Town Hall and Palmetto Park Road. On the right is an image looking south from uh, in front of Town Hall. So the traffic signal is at Palmetto Park Road. This is an aerial view of Boca Raton in 1940, and I, I will come back to this. Um, the reason for showing this is that uh, a lot of the property of the future Boca Raton Army Airfield 
uh, seems to have been undeveloped at the time, not even in cultivation, uh, not all of it. The yellow arrow, arrow actually points to our airport, which was built in the mid thirties by the WPA. Uh, and that today would be located in the southeast corner of what is Florida Atlantic University campus. First, let's talk about war on the home front. 1942, Operation Drumbeat is in effect. Uh, and this is where German U-boats are attacking merchant shipping off the Atlantic coast and in the Gulf of Mexico because they're trying to uh, stop the supply line to Europe. And we know there were 16 ships torpedoed between Cape Canaveral and Boca Raton in the summer of 42. And our local citizens were eyewitnesses to this terrifying time. They could uh, see smoke, sometimes smell it, uh, hear the explosions, uh, and also see things float ashore, sometimes bodies. Blackout conditions were in effect. And what this means that nobody could shine lights out of their house in the evening. Uh, and so the idea was, if you did have lights shining out from a community, it could possibly silhouette those merchant ships and make them a much easier target for the U-boats. So most people put curtains or boards or something uh, to cover their windows. You could buy from General Electric a light bulb that had black painted around the side so the light shines up. But I imagine that was for rich people. It sounded kind of expensive to me. But most people just may do with what they could find. And of course, air raid warnings became a way of life. Uh, the air raid siren was in the cupola of town hall. So here are two of our favorite townies from the war. Young Martha and Peter Barrett were kids during the war. And they lived at two spots in Boca Raton during the war years. Um, first of all, the Boca Raton Villas, which you see at lower right, was a um, tourist, um, tourist cabins located on A1A south of Palmetto Park Road, roughly where the Beresford condominium is today. Now later, they, I know they lived in El Foresta and they went to school at the Boca Raton School. Uh, because they were living at the beach, they certainly were eyewitnesses to these sub-attacks. And this can of Maxwell House coffee actually floated ashore. And uh, Do Peter Barrett, now Dr. Barrett, uh, collected it and saved it, low these many years, uh, and donated it to the Historical Society a number of years ago. And it is absolutely one of my favorite artifacts in the collection. Um, because it really documents in, in, in three dimensions uh, this horrific, frightening, amazing time in our community's past and in, in world history. Um, it has never been open. It's obviously been down to the, deep, the depths and popped back up. Um, and of course, ironically, coffee was rationed back in the day. So good for the Barretts for not opening it. We also have... Um, Grandfather Barrett's a list of torpedo incidences in May of 42, right off Boca Raton. Upper left, you can see the Potrero del Llano burning in the Gulf Stream. Uh, and to your lower right is a view of Boca Raton villas and neighbors, um, which is the site you would see if you were indeed a German so there's a very interesting incident that happened in 42 that involves the Barretts. They were, uh, Martha and Peter were home with mom uh, and it was the middle of the night in 42 and they heard the roar of motorcycles uh, and the Coast Guard uh, arrived at the house and accused them of shining lights offshore, which of course would have been very illegal and illicit. They said, no, it's not us, but our neighbors to the south, the Sanborns, are snowbirds. They are not in residence. So um, Dr. B recalls that they could hear the motorcycles rev up again. And they went next door. And there they found in the Sanborn house 
evidence that the beds have been slept in, food half eaten, towels, uh, and a telescope and signaling device by that bay window that you can see at lower left. That's the beach side of the Sanborn house. The Sanborn house stood approximately where the Excelsior condominium stands today on A1A. No people were found. Uh, remember, it was black eye conditions. Whoever had been there had left hurriedly. Uh, where did they come from exactly? Where were they going? We're not sure. They were obviously up to no good. Uh, and our friend Sally Ling, who wrote the book Small Town Big Secrets about the Boca Raton field, tried her darndest to document this through official records. And we had no luck at that. Uh, there could be a number of reasons for that. Uh, remember, it was a wartime. There were a lot of things going on like that. Uh, but within a week of hearing this story from the Barrett's, which was, what, 2003 or four, a long time ago, I got a call from Charles Hutchinson, Dr. Sanborn's great nephew. And he said, Susan, I want to tell you the story that my uncle told me about the war. And he relates the same story. So fascinatingly, we have a verification from the sort of the two main sources of the story. Uh, as a result, uh, Sally uh, and the Barretts and Charles um, got together with the city and created a plaque dedicated to this interesting espionage incident and had it mounted on a wall which divides the two condominiums today, the Barretsford and the Excelsior. The wall is actually left over from the Sanborn estate. It's actually a decorative concrete wall. Today, it's a right of way for the city to get to the beach. So the wall is much older than the condominiums on either side of it. Uh, and it's actually an artifact of this time. And that's why the plaque is on the wall. You can hear um, Peter Barrett's accounting uh, of this interesting time and his youth in World War II in Boca Raton. On our YouTube channel, we have recorded a lecture that he gave for us a few years ago, and I think you'll find it really fascinating. We also had the aircraft warning service. It was a civilian service. And what this meant is that there were spotting towers. Uh, ours was in what is today Red Reef Park, and you can see a picture of it on the left. Um, in a town like Fort Lauderdale would be the top of the highest building, the Sweet Building, which is nine was nine stories high. In my town of Oakland Park, it was on top of somebody's garage, <laughs> and that would be manned during daylight hours by civilians of the aircraft warning service. Uh, and in to qualify for this, you had to memorize the silhouettes of both Axis and Allied aircraft, and your job was to report any aircraft flying over. And so this is something that people of all ages and genders could do. So it's something like young Peter could do with mom uh, after school. And you can imagine what an exciting task this was for a young man, nine, 10 years old, uh, to you know climb up a rickety old uh, tower and have to memorize military planes. The Rubber model at upper right hung from the tower, a spot to tower to reinforce your knowledge of the planes. And this was later gifted to Peter Barrett. And also Coca-Cola distributed playing cards like the ones you see at center with silhouettes of the plane. So you could while away your time while you're in the tower uh, playing cards, but also reinforcing your knowledge of the aircraft. Of course, we had a lot of locals sign up, volunteer, uh, or were drafted uh, for service during the war. One of our favorite sons, Dave Ash, is shown here. He's on the right, on the left, and on the left, on the right. Uh, he served in the Navy. He was in the South Pacific. Uh, and you can see two pictures of him with his buddies at Pearl Harbor in 1945. Every American was impacted by World War II. Because even if you didn't have a friend, a relative um, in service, rationing was in effect. 
and everyone is, was impacted by rationing. Not only was fuel, rubber, metals, leather rationed, but things like flour and sugar. And local citizens were encouraged to grow victory gardens, to learn to can and preserve the old fashioned way, to try and ease their reliance on commercial products and make sure that was available for the soldiers and the war effort. Now, Palm Beach County was pretty much an armed camp during the war. There were air bases established all over Florida during the war for a few reasons. Number one, good flying weather. Number two, proximity to uh, shipping lanes for practice purposes, but also um, because there was a lot of wide open cheap land back then. Palm Beach County itself, we had a number of different types of military installations. Um, Ream Hospital was where the breakers is. We had the Civil Air Patrol, first at Morrison Field and then Lantana. We had the Coast Guard Auxiliary. We had the Coast Guard uh, Women's Auxiliary, the SPARS. Uh, Morrison Field, which today is Palm Beach International Airport, was a very important Army Air Base. It was the last air base that um, Army air crews would see uh, before they left, they flew across the Atlantic. So for a lot of soldiers, it was the last sight of US soil they saw. But by far the largest installation was the Boca Raton Army Airfield. So before the war even begins, um, people are aware that it's just a matter of time before the US gets dragged into the war. And the, our local commissioners um, deputized our mayor, J.C. Mitchell, to go to Washington to try and lure one of these new military bases we knew were coming in 41, even before Pearl Harbor. Uh, well, apparently he was not alone in this because um, all towns realized this would be a great boon to the local economy. Uh, and first, our town was in discussion with the U.S. Navy they sent an, uh, some envoys here, um, but that fell through. Um, and in fact, instead, we uh, won the Boca Raton Army Airfield. A little history of that. The Army Air Corps established their radar training school at Scott Field, Illinois, a week before Pearl Harbor. They needed better flying weather, so they moved to Morrison, West Palm Beach, in January of 42. And then in May, the government started acquiring land for a larger base at Boca Ridge Home, uh, and construction began. The mascot of the Boca Ridge Home Army Airfield was a pelican. I know that the mascot of the Fort Lauderdale Naval Air Station was a duck. So I'm kind of guessing that most air bases had some kind of bird as an emblem. Uh, so who was here? It's the Army Air Force Technical Training Command, the Air Corps Airborne Radar Training Base, the only one during those years from May 42 through 47. Does that mean it's the only radar training base? No, no, no. It, it's the Air Corps only radar training base. Uh, as a result, thousands and thousands of men were stationed here, however briefly. Uh, during those years of the war, as many as 15,000 at one time at a, in a town of 700, 750 people. And what this means is there could be as many as 50,000 to 100,000, we don't know, soldiers who came through Boca Raton during those five years. That's why we don't have records on most of the enlisted men that I get inquiries about. To begin with, of course, they, the base needed a place to land, so to speak. Uh, and so the military leased the Boca Raton Club for a period of about two years. And it served as a temporary headquarters of the base. And you can see on your left, the brass visiting the beautiful west side of the Boca Raton Club. And to your right, the command staff uh, planning probably the construction of the base. And they are in a hotel room. We know from the staff that they uh, quickly 
packed up the antiques, rolled up the carpets, tried to pad the decorative columns against the onslaught of enlisted men. Now, you might think this was the most luxurious barracks in the entire US, and that might have been true at least for a while. Uh, at upper left, we have one of my absolute favorite pictures. We have a bunch of uh, young men enjoying a little R&R on the golf course. Uh, but by the same token, to your right, we have guys practicing waterborne landing training in the garden pool. Uh, let me tell you where that was. Uh, the garden pool uh, was where the Great Hall, which is the old convention center is uh, at the hotel. So if you go around the Camino Real Circle and head north up the drive into the hotel, on your right, that's the, the Great Hall. And the, when they built that in the late 60s, they actually kept the three of the four walls of this very beautiful out exterior pool and built the, the, the Great Hall inside the pool. It's kind of hilarious. So um, that, that still survives, at least for the moment. But I think the plans are to demolish, unfortunately, uh, the handsome walls of the old pool. Uh, well, the point is that pretty soon the golf courses uh, had foxholes in them. At the time, there were two golf courses, uh, the north course, north of, of Camino Real, and the south course, the south of Camino Real, and the south course uh, was never uh, reopened after the war. So I think it got really torn up. And, you know, we have the pool, uh, according to the soldiers I talked to, the veterans, the water pressure didn't go up much past the first floor. So it wasn't idyllic as it sounds after a while. Uh, however, we have this wonderful postcard from Cadet Alvin Thiele. He sent to his folks who saved it for him, returned it to him, and he in turn donated it to our collection many years ago. And it is wonderful. He says, pictures don't lie. So here is just what the club looks like. Only add a million beautiful colors and mild weather and there you have it. How could the Boca Resort and Club ask for better promotional material? Interestingly, we know there were some Tuskegee Airmen stationed at the Boca Raton Club. And we know this courtesy on Dr. James Williams, who was one of those Tuskegee Airmen. Uh, and he recollected there were about 26 Tuskegee Airmen at the hotel in 42. Now, of course, before this, there had never been any uh, black guests at the hotel. Uh, Dr. Williams didn't recall any particularly prejudicial treatment at this particular site, uh, other than the Tuskegee Airmen were, you know, barracked together. They would be in adjoining rooms. This is not true of most of our black soldiers who served at the base, however. So let's talk about the field itself. Braff was 5,800 acres more or less uh, with over 800 buildings. The main entrance was at Northwest 4th Avenue and Palmetto Park Road. And you can see a picture of the main gate upper right. Um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about the acquisition of the base um, by the military uh, through eminent domain. It's kind of interesting and um, a little bit complicated. So first of all, the limits of the base, and you can see my wonderful now map uh, compared to then, uh, extended from Palmetto Park Road on the south to north of Yamato uh, on the north from the Florida East Coast Railway tracks, think Dixie Highway on the east, to what is today the CSX Yamtrak tracks on the west, think I-95, with a bite out where Old Floresta and the Art Museum School are, that was not on the base, and where City Hall is, that was not on the base. Uh, and you can see on your left, I have delineated FAU and our airport in green, and you can see that corresponds to the runways of the field. So many people know that FAU was where the airbase was, 
Um, however, I think a lot of people don't realize it. That was just a quarter, about a quarter of the base. Uh, most of the buildings were east of there and south of there. So here we have, again, my 1940 view and my 1942 view. The lower arrow, the yellow arrow to your left and to your right, the lower arrow, uh, that's about where Glades Road is, okay? And the oval at the top is Yamato, the remains of the Yamato settlement. That black squiggly line uh, that runs north and south through the picture, that's the El Rio Canal. So that's the eastern limits of FAU today. We know that there were approximately 50 families, white, black, and Japanese, displaced when the War Department acquired this property by eminent domain. And uh, it's kind of hard topic to research, um, but of course, very common during the war years. Eminent domain basically means the government wants your property, here's some money, get out. Uh, and you can sue, uh, but you can imagine during wartime, it's not very politically correct to object. I believe, I've done some research on this, uh, and I have reason to believe that the War Department did not know or care from whom they were acquiring property, at least initially. And the reason I say that is because there, we have a document in our collection that was um, left over from the old engineering department in, uh, at the city, a copy. Uh, it's a mimeograph copy of what's called the order of taking. And what it is is a list of parcels and parcel numbers that formed the Boca Raton Army Airfield. Someone has come back and handwritten in pen the names of the property owners. And that's how we know who owns the property. Uh, so I suspect that was done by the city. Now, eventually, of course, the government paid the citizens, so they did know who owned the property. But initially, I'm not sure they, as I say, I'm not sure that they knew more to be researched. On the other hand, we have this list and map diagram created by the city of what they call the vendors to the War Department that does enumerate the property owners, how much acreage, and then that corresponds to a map. The big loser in all this was the Lake Worth Drainage District, which oversees the El Rio Canal. And back then there were a lot of auxiliary canals that they oversaw. Eula Rollerson, whose dad, Mr. Purdom, lived in a house on West Palmetto Park Road on the north side, just west of the Florida East Coast tracks. Uh, recalled her dad was mad as a snake. <laughs> he was paid, but not what he felt the property was valued at. But like I said, I don't think it was very politically correct. So what this mean, does mean is the end of the Yamato colony. So I just wanted to talk about that. Uh, for a minute, begin a discussion on that. Um, I think uh, there's a lot of um, urban myths regarding this er era, and uh, uh, it's because of some misconceptions. Um, first of all, the people um, are under the impression that where FAU is today was part of the Yamato colony, and I, I don't have any evidence for that. I think their properties were east of that. Um, and uh, um, also people are under the misconception that most of the Boca Raton field belonged to these Japanese Americans. This is very not true. We know that, remember Yamato founded roughly 1905, located west of Yamato about Dixie Highway. Never more than 35 to 50 people. By the uh, 20s, most of those folks uh, sold out, left, went back to Japan, New York, various places. And um, by 1942, there are actually about 13 people that we know of that are still left. The Kamiyas, the Kobayashis, and two bachelors, George Murakami and Mr. Kami Kama. And 
Of these four, um, remember there were 5,800 acres that comprised the base. 300 were owned by people with Japanese names. Uh, several of the names, there will be nine acres here or 10 acres here, were actually uh, former Yamato colonists who had moved away. So they're sort of absentee folks. So four families were really impacted uh, at this juncture. And the, uh, I know the little buildings of Yamato were demolished or possibly recycled. Uh, there is one little newspaper article I found that sort of alludes to the fact that they, they're recycling, moving the little houses. They're building hundreds of wooden buildings and tar paper shacks. Why not recycle these? But what happened to them where they moved? I can't tell you, unfortunately, but it seems a terrible waste to destroy all of these. Uh, this interesting story, we're not done yet. And uh, we're going to take up this story uh, next time. We're going to continue with the Yamato colony um, and World War II. So we thank you for joining us today. So be sure and tune in to the next episode next Thursday, where we take up the story uh, of the end of the Yamato colony uh, and the Boko Raton Army airfield.